Stephen Kenny there talking about Matt Doherty. Kenny Cunningham is uh, with us. Kenny, good morning to you. Morning, lads. Uh, as a as a noted goal scoring fullback yourself, you must, <laughs> you must be proud. He's overrated. <laughs> These goal scoring fullbacks are overrated. Yeah. <laughs> should, we, should we bring up the statistic again? No outfield direction. player. No outfield player in the history of the Premier League played more games without scoring a goal. Ah, a great era, Nathan. Totally different era. <laughs> Ah, or forced them to get upfield. It's just let such me. a brilliant stat. <laughs> it's certainly a, a, proud of an it. interesting stat. <laughs> Good morning to you. It's a great move for him, right? Um, look, it, it is a great move for him. I'm actually uh, delighted for him. But really, when you break it down, lads, um, it's not as if he's going from a club kind of, you know, scrambling at the bottom end of the Premiership to a club kind of challenging at the top. I mean, pretty much uh, Wolves and Tottenham have been kind of dovetailing all season for those kind of Champions League stroke Europa uh, places. So from a footballing perspective, you look at it and initially you think, lads, oh, great move. And it is a great move, don't get me wrong. And I've got a lot of respect for what um, um, Matt's doing because he's clearly wants to challenge himself again in a different environment. I think possibly the appeal of playing under Marino, uh, different group of players, almost having to prove yourself I I again, just that type of challenge. I I I'm guessing without knowing uh, Matt too well, that's what's kind of uh, driving the move because if you look at it on the flip side, if I look at the, the environment of Wolves, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Wolves' manager at noon. I think he's as good as anybody around. I put him up there with Klopp and, and Guardiola in terms of his body of work over the past couple of years. Uh, I'm, I'm hugely impressed with him. I think he's a great manager uh, and coach. So it can't be easy taking yourself out of that environment. I'm sure Matt will probably say he's probably grown and improved as a player under uh, Nuno's tutelage. And that's a club which has continued to grow. You don't look at Wolves and think, well, that's it, they've peaked, they're on their way down now. Maybe Matt got a sense, potentially the manager might be on his way in the next year or two. I'm not too sure. But from a footballing perspective, personally, I would have been in a rush to jump out of that type of environment because I think it's a great environment. And I think of one thing Nuno said la last year, and it really kind of registered with me, uh, it was a very simple thing. He was asked about Traore, who'd come into the club and really improved and uh, under him and really grown and, uh, uh, and developed more. You hadn't done at previous clubs. He'd moved on Aston Villa, etc., and Middlesbrough, and people are thinking, oh, he's just one trick pony. He's just, you know, he's bulling the china shop. This fella can't play football. And he said something very simple. He said, well, at this football club, he said, we don't give up on players, never. And, it's, and, and that, for me, kind of really registered in terms. That gave me kind of a bit of a window into the mentality of the manager and his kind of people skills. So, so yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's a great move for him. I think it's a great move for Tottenham, exactly uh, uh, what they wanted. But, um, yeah, for the reasons that I've said, lad, I think when you actually analyse it, you think to yourself, well, hopefully it'll prove to be a good move in terms of uh, sports will improve and get some more players in because they're in a period of uh, transition as well. And I wouldn't say Wolves are. For me, that's a very settled squad at Wolves, very impressive squad, great manager and a, and a club on the up. But I totally understand his motivation, Matt, if he felt he was having spent that time at the football club. It was probably now or never, lads, for him. I think he's probably at his peak for the reasons that you, uh, you've mentioned. And I can understand the, the temptation to go and prove yourself uh, at a different club in a, in a different environment. So good luck to him. The concern from the outside, Kenny, is that when you watch Matt Doherty at Wolves, he's such a key figure in how they line up. And you see the same balls played to him all the time from the back three, over the top, over in that right wing position. He'll make a inward run on the inside of a damage triore. They were so well coached that it seemed to suit Matt Doherty down to the ground and it gave him that freedom to get forward. With Jose Mourinho, and now Stephen Kenny, I don't think we heard it there, countered this yesterday from what he'd seen with Spurs, and he felt that Serge Aurier almost played as a, a right winger, that the left back tucked in, but that Aurier played way up on the right-hand side, and he doesn't seem to share the concerns a lot of people have, that Matt Doherty's going to be a right back, stuck inside his own half, playing under Jose Mourinho. Do you think he'll have the same sort of freedom for Spurs that he had at Wolves to get up that right wing? No, I think, no, I think you're right. I think it's a fair point. Uh, predominantly, Spurs will play, um, Wolves play with that back three and Matt as the wing back. I don't think that'll happen too often at Spurs. Uh, Marino traditionally is stuck with that kind of four... 3-3 three, three formation, so I think he will have to modify his game ever so slowly. You're right, those big switches of play, uh, Connor Cody in particular was great at hitting those big diagonal balls 
over to Matt. He used to keep that high line. You're right high up the pitch. and made those diagonal runs in behind opposition fullbacks uh, into space. But the modern game is not as if we're talking about you're slagging me about like no goals playing as a when I used to play as a fullback. When I played as a fullback, we just it was a totally different position, uh, Nathan. You know, our start position was so much more deeper. You know, we just weren't committed to, uh, into areas that high up the pitch. Even in an orthodox back four, now you see fullbacks. Uh, take a, a higher uh, starting position than you normally would have expected years ago. But you are right. I think there are certain differences of playing in an orthodox far, even in a team where they encourage full-backs to get forward. But I'm sure he's clever enough. He'll make those adjustments. He'll still have the freedom to go and get forward and, and be productive in the final tour. You don't bring Matt Doherty into your football club and then put the reins on him in, in terms where I want to see you pick and choose your moments to go forward and really concentrate on the defensive side of your game. His, his qualities are in the attacking sort of the pitch. Uh, you know his ability to uh, combine with people, get into the box, and kind of sniff out goals and create goals. So, so I think you're right. I think he would have to modify his game slightly because I think the the not so much this, uh, the style of play to a certain extent, but the the formation will be different. But I'm sure he's bright enough now. Like I said, he's that he's that age. He's, he's smart. I think he'll understand what's required of, and he'll make those small adjustments uh, to his game if he has to. Kenny, a text in from John wondering, is Seamus Coleman going to look back on his career and regret not making a move to a bigger club than Everton? No, that's a great point. I mean, I've, I've mentioned this before. Like, I mean, every two, pe two different people say circumstances are different, timings, everything in football, as we said. But I, I think you're probably right. It's a good point uh, the, uh, the lads made there. I think Seamus probably arrived at that moment in his career some, some years ago. And I remember saying Seamus was playing that level, probably similar uh, to Matt. Uh, he was absolutely uh, exceptional. Seamus could have played for any club in the in the world. He was playing that good. And there was there was talk of Manchester United, Chelsea lads. You remember around that kind of time, and he could have gone. There was no doubt about it. I mean, maybe he would have had to fight his way out of the football club. Maybe he wasn't that type of character. Maybe he was happy where he was. Uh, he, he was settled. You know, two two different personalities, two different different set of circumstances. But you're right. Seamus probably had that decision uh, to make some years ago uh, as well and decided for Reverend Reese to stay where he was, and he's been a great stalwart for everything. He'll be an absolute uh, legend there. I'm sure he feels he made the right decision. It, it was the one he was most comfortable with. But obviously, Matt's come to a different uh, conclusion. He's felt the need, no, I want to go, I want to take a step outside, and I want to go and challenge myself uh, somewhere else. So I don't think there's a right or wrong, lad. I think everybody's different and makes, their re their, makes the decisions for different reasons. Let's talk about this week. It's a huge, huge week from Stephen Kenny's perspective. It's the first opportunity to get in and actually show the players on the training pitch what you want them to do. And he's talked about the importance for him in the perception of Irish football being changed from, uh, you know, pre-match, the, the manager of the opposition always goes, oh, Ireland, they're a stereotypical little British side, you know, they'll, yeah. uh, they'll be aggressive, they'll get the ball forward early. And he's like, I want people to change how they think about us. I want it to be successful, and the only way they're going to change how they think about it is if we start winning and qualifying for things. But I want people to start thinking about Irish football as something distinctive. From your perspective, when you hear that, what do you think? No, I'm very encouraged by it. I love to hear it. And it kind of blends into what kind of uh, Stephen's consistently been kind of saying about kind of Irish players, whether in the UK or in Ireland or wherever they are, just in terms of how... You know, we talk our players down too much. We don't talk them up in terms of the qualities which they have. And, and there's, there's been a sense of that around for a number of uh, years now, lads. Uh, managers really talking uh, down our players. I mean, um, I remember Trapattoni like talking about players, the standard they were at. You know what to expect. You know, championship players, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I didn't like to hear it. If I was a player, I wouldn't like to hear that being uh, uh, talked down. So, I think it's quite refreshing to hear. Um, Stephen extolled the virtues, uh, the football and qualities uh, of our players. And I think he's right. I think we have real talent uh, in the country, and even in terms from a tactical uh, point of view. And he's probably talking about a little bit in terms of psychology there, getting into the heads of the players and making them um, uh, believe a little bit more in themselves that, yeah, they have got that ferocious work ethic, which, is, which has been our kind of hallmark, and rightly so. But let's be honest, lads, a lot of the, t a lot of the top nations have that anyway. It's not as if which is something which is, you know, totally reserved to ourselves. But I think we have got those uh, those individual uh, qualities that Stephen has talked about. Maybe just has to convince the players a little bit more of that, give them a little bit of confidence. And that's what good management is all about, you know, uh, getting into the players of the head, into the heads of the players, giving them confidence and giving them that kind of belief and marrying those two things that that we're we're talking about here. And if we can do that over a period of time. Hopefully, Stephen get the very best out of out of the players. But he's right. Ultimately, at the end of the day, lads, about 
It's about results. It's about a style of playing, a way of playing football that ultimately, you know, brings a level of success. You know, that's got to be spoken about as well. Kenny, something that stood out with, with the 21s, and listen, I know it's under 21 level, was that with the wave 21s, the squad was always changing. Players were being called up to seniors. There were a lot of players missing. But the style actually never changed. There was always that willingness to get the ball down, regardless of who the 11 were. It, senior international football is obviously very different then. And James McCarthy is a player he spoke about a huge amount over the past couple of weeks, has been integral should be the best Irish midfielder of his generation and wanted them in that middle of the midfield three, which we expect it'll be. It looks as though he's going to miss these games. Like You spoke yesterday about Harry Archer potentially stepping in. Is McCarthy a huge loss for what Kenny wants to do if he's talking about style of football? Or do you think actually there's other players who can do a similar job? Um, well, I agree with Steve in relation to James. I've always been a, a huge fan of uh, James. Received a lot of kind of uh, criticism for it, even when he was struggling with injury and, and, and not in the squad because just because they just very quickly assessed the qualities that James had. And when you want to play the type of football, a style of football, maybe that we're talking about, Stephen's talking about, generally that central midfield area is 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 always key. And 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 that that kind of deep line midfielder who's closest to the the defensive line who who can interact with them, take the ball off them, and move move the ball up the pitch for you to cut it through the lines, uh, etc. And I, I always felt James could do that. And he's a very accomplished player for me, James. He's got a defensive mentality. He can trust the male possession. He kind of senses danger. He makes his fair share of tackles. He kind of sees danger. And in possession, he's very efficient in his, his, his use of the football. Not too many 40, 50 yard diagonal passes, but he gets the ball, he, he passes it quickly, one, two touch, and he passes it forward. So, so that type of player, regardless of his name, that type of player in that central midfield area is always invaluable. So it's a shame he's not available. I didn't realise that, lads, because I was looking forward to seeing him play. Have we got another player of that ilk? You've mentioned Harry Arthur. I don't see Harry Arthur of that ilk, to be honest with you. I wasn't a big fan of Harry Arthur playing in a, in a, in a, a holding midfield position. I didn't think he had the defensive uh, qualities. He's a tidy, technical player. But I saw Harry Arthur as more of an offence-minded player, operating a little bit higher up the pitch. Of the players who are there, Jason Malumbi is the player for me who potentially he could, he could play that uh, position as inexperienced as he is. I mean, he's a great all-round player, Jason. He's, he's got the engine to get box to box. He's a very uh, dy dynamic player, but he's, um, he's, he's, he's aggressive. Uh, he gets tight to people. He makes tackles. So it's asking, it's asking a little bit much at the moment to play that kind of uh, disciplined hold in midfield position, but I think he has the qualities to do, and I think if he's looking for a player, I'd be leaning towards Jason Malumbi in that kind of hold in midfield position of a three that you're talking about. Uh, rather than Harry Arthur, but it's how the manager sees it, of course. It's the first week, you know. Do you do you try and fit them both in and hope that between the two of them, like pick pick that pick those three in midfield first, then Kenny. Well, if if it's going to be a four-three-three, which we're all uh, thinking that might be uh, might be the case. So, uh, well, I always go back to um, <laughs> I always go back to the, the French game. It's amazing, isn't it? I always, I can't get it out of my head. The the playoff game against France. How long has that go, lads? Ten years. Ten mm. years, lads. Ten years. Can you believe it? Is it eleven years now? And Nearly. We, yeah, but we lined up that day with James McCarthy. In midfield three, that inverted triangle, James McCarthy at the base. Oh, that, that, that's, that's only three years ago, Kenny, or four years ago. Don't worry about that. Oh, that one. Sorry. sorry. That one. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was in the playoff. That was in the Euros. Yeah, the last 16. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Game. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that that was that three for me. That that was that was almost pair. I saw something that day with James McCarthy, Robbie Brady, and Jeff Henry. That I thought, wow, this is the way forward. This this dynamic, this this trio midfield. This is this is the way forward for us now for the next like six years. It was that good. The balance was that good. James offering that kind of defensive solidity and kind of ability to get on the ball and move us up the pitch. And Jeff and Robbie operating in those kind of higher number eight positions, like uh, technically good enough to get on the ball in the half turn, but having the legs to get forward combined with those front three players. It was fantastic. Although we lost that game, I was actually buzzing because I thought, wow, that was great. I love what I saw in that midfield area. So for me, like, I, I know uh, James is not playing, so for me, I could, I could easily throw Jason Malumbi. I'm talking about midfield three, Jason Malumbi, Robbie Brady and a, and a, and a Jeff Hendrick as, as a three. I think he's got options there. He could throw Hardy Arthur in. Uh, I think Callum O'Dowd is an interesting one in there, lads. Callum O'Dowd played a couple of minutes under Martin. Martin played him in midfield three in one of those advanced positions. 
And I, I saw something there in Callum O'Dowd, and I thought, wow, because he's so quick, lad. He's powerful in possession, like when he strides forward with the ball, he eats up the ground. And he showed me a little bit there. So I'm sure Stephen will be looking at, at all of this, all, all those little kind of uh, permutations. But that midfield three for me, I'd love to see Jason Malumbi get a start. Although I think he can play different midfield positions, not hold the midfield position. It's that real defensive solidity. We're all different, lads. And I look at holding midfield, first and foremost, yeah, he's got to be able to play and get on the ball in the modern game. We understand that. But for me, it's all about what's his defensive mindset. Can he defend out possession? Does he sense danger? Can he cut those passing lanes into opposition centre forwards? You know what I mean? Can he can he make tackles? Can he track runners? You know what I mean? Just sense danger. That's just me. That's probably just you know that that that, that that's what I look for in nation. I think Jace Malumbi uh, has that. I don't think Harry Arthur has, and that's the type of player I'd like to see in the holding midfield position if James uh, isn't available to play. Nathan, what's he also it? seems to have a sorry. I was going to say I'm a, I'm a Lumbee. He also seems to have a lot of personality, Kenny. Which maybe with Hendrick and McCarthy is the one thing on the pitch that we have lacked from them. Okay, McCarthy has barely played actually since that game against France. Hasn't played for Ireland in nearly four years. No. But they're two quiet lads. Whereas Malumbi, given the captaincy of the 21s, in fact, he almost had too much personality at times. You think of the game against Italy. Kenny has to take him off with half an hour to go because he'd been booked and he was on the verge of being sent off. That actually having that young strong voice who's going to be very vocal in the middle of midfield is another attribute for Malumbi that means even though he's quite inexperienced they shouldn't be afraid of throwing him in there No you're right I mean I worked with Jason a couple of years ago with the with the, with the 19 so I got a bit of a flavour that you're right I, actually, I enjoyed working with him and he has real kind of personality uh, you're absolutely there's a bit of fire in his belly He's got, to, he's got to learn to control that, of course he does, as you do, particularly in international football at, at the highest level. You have to kind of temper it, keep a cool head and make uh, kind of rational decisions in and out possession of the football. But I, ju- I just like his whole um, and makeup. He was at Brighton, he was a big kind of groomed as a kind of holding uh, mid- uh, midfielder, just kind of a deep line. We've been talking about it here, but very quickly you could see he had a lot more to his game. He had that energy to go box to box. He was very tenacious, lads, like you were talking about, on the tackle. A bit forward, he had that to him as well. Picked up a, a number of bookings. But you're right. Vocally, you're right, uh, Nathan, but wouldn't be the biggest thing for me. It's just his whole kind of uh, personality and his all-round game, really. I think that type of midfielder we've been we've been looking for for some years. Glenn Whelan gave it to us uh, to a certain degree, but it looks as if now Glenn's career is coming to an end. So just that kind of really kind of high energy player in that central area that can eat up the ground, who can kind of you know make tackles, uh, you know th- that type of player. I think we maybe we've been lacking. We have got those kind of technical players. I mean, Jeff, you, you, uh, you could argue Jeff Hendrick one or two others, Harry Arthur in possession of football, but that really kind of tenacious box to box traditional type midfielder. Really, I'd put Jason in that type of mould, able to actually. Uh, operate in one or two different positions and, and with his age it's it's great he's got his best years ahead of him so hopefully he's going to be a big part uh, of our future Nathan how much does it matter that a lot of people haven't played football as you've spoken about it's six months really since we've seen Hendrick or Brady can they go straight into a game like this does the does the manager think that they can go straight into a game like this the manager certainly does I, I brought this up with Stephen Kenny yesterday and we touched on it that like Darren Randolph is second string keeper at West Ham at the moment hasn't played I don't think since January Jeff Hendrick because of his move hasn't played a competitive game since March. Matt Doherty hasn't played in three weeks, has been on holidays, is coming straight into this. Like Stephen Kenny made the point, things have changed. These players are always, always in good condition. So it doesn't sound as though that's going to be a factor in his team selection at all, that he feels anybody who's in, anybody who's training, he can pick. Certainly for this first match, maybe that changes slightly for the Finland game when they've had a full, tough, grueling 90 minutes in Bulgaria for a lot of them, the first of the season, that he has to change things around. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little bit of rotation over these couple of games. Like he has a lot of options, as Kenny touched on there. If it's Harry Arthur, Jeff Hendrick, uh, Jason Malumbi in midfield, which maybe is sort of what he's looking at. Like, you can slot Robbie Brady in there. No problem. So I, I think I, also there's eight games between now and November. The players are playing league matches every week. I think everybody's going to get a chance over the next three months. Well, So I asked Kenny for his midfield three. Is that your midfield three that you think it's going to be... Harry Archer. I, I, I think if, if McCarthy was fit, it would have been McCarthy, Hendrick, and Malumbi or Howerton. But I think just I asked him about McCarthy. He spoke about Harry Arthur again, even before the squad was announced. He mentioned how well Harry Arthur was playing for Fulham. So he's certainly the player he's name checked most often. So going on what Kenny's saying, I would say most likely it is Arthur, Hendrick, Malumbi. And Hendrick is going to be a crucial player, you feel, for uh, Stephen Kenny. Talks him up at every possible opportunity. But again, I wouldn't, what Kenny's saying with Malumbi, if he feels he's in that role, 
that'll be fine and you can put Howard and Brady in there as well. And what's the front three? I think that's where there's the most debate. So on the right, he touched on Callum O'Dowd in the midfield position. O'Dowd is named as one of the forwards. Probably on the right, either O'Dowda or Robinson. I'd say Robinson is probably slightly ahead at the moment. On the left, either McLean or Connolly. Maybe Connolly slightly ahead at the moment. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if they change over the two games. And then, does he throw Adam Ida in here from the start? It's probably the big question. Troy Parrott's out injured. Or do you go with the experience of Shane Long? I think he's going to go with Ida. So maybe that, again, puts... <laughs> Uh, James McLean just have a bit more experience on there, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was a front three for this game because remember Dave McGoldrick isn't available for Bulgaria, maybe back for for Sunday if it was a front three of Robinson, Ida, and Connolly. Wow, that's pretty young and exciting. Yeah, I don't know what Kenny thinks if that's a bit too risky. Kenny, what do you think? No, again, it's, I think it's really exciting the potential combinations he has high up the pitch. I mean, obviously, right, the central striker. I mean, I'd love to see Adam Oyer again. Why not we throw the young fella and let him have a look at it? Nothing, nothing to lose. We know exactly what Shane Long brings to the team. I'd maybe look a little bit at the wide areas. I think that'll it'll tell a tale in terms of how Stephen sees it. I mean, in terms of style of play you're talking, lads. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me really if he if he goes maybe the opposite of what Nathan is talking about and plays a uh, potential right foot on the left hand side and, and vice versa. So let's say Callum Robinson right foot on the left hand side and say Aaron, Aaron Connolly on the on the right coming inside. And the reason for that is if you know if you want to encourage a wide man to come on the inside and fill those inside kind of uh, uh, pockets and leave space for your your full back to get into those kind of wide areas and on the overlap. That's generally what you see in the in the modern game. You know, wingers coming on the inside, getting very uh, 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 narrow to the centre forward, so they can play little one twos kind of combinations. Not that traditional wide man, which which James actually is, who plays wide left, likes to stay wide left, likes to see the whole pitch in his inside, likes to beat his man on the outside and get crosses in the box, which is great to see. But generally speaking, in the modern game, you see a lot of those wingers come on the inside 10, 15 yards off the touchline, and they ask the opposition fullback a question. You're going to follow me in? If you are, then that leaves the space for the fullback to get himself on the overlap, i.e., Ender Stevens and Matt Doherty. So if you want to play more of a passing game, play a little like 10, 15 yard passes, find people around the corner in, in spaces, little combinations. You probably go with those wingers on the op- opposite side, to be honest with you, if you understand what I'm saying. So, again, that'd be an indication in terms of how Stevens season in terms of style of play who he plays in those wide areas you know left foot players on the left right foot players on the right or the actual opposite okay one one last point here that we haven't actually brought up then we started this conversation by the uh by talking about the big move that's just happened for the right full back or right wing back and now we're saying he's going to be in the team and the ireland captain is getting dropped at right back or are we finding some way to find our two best right-sided defensive players in the team or not, Kenny? Well, you can't you can't put them both in the team in a, when you play a flat four. We've we found that out over in Gibraltar under uh, under Mick. Uh, the only way to get them both into the team is to revert to a back uh, three uh, and play a three five two. Because I still feel as if Shaman could be Shaman could be incorporated into the team right of a three. I'm a big fan of fullbacks playing at a back three. Paris, particularly international football, you don't have to deal too much with kind of continual crosses into the box. So if you're going to get both of those, if he's determined to get both of those players into the team, you've got to you've got to change the system to a three-five-two. For me, play Gary Doherty right wing back, and play Seamus Coleman right of a three. And I actually think there is an argument for that. I think I'd actually I'd actually love to see that. But if it's going to be an orthodox uh, back four or four-three-three, three, I think Matt Doherty is going to play. And and a new captain. Yeah, that would be the case. Obviously, Seamus. Yeah, Seamus wouldn't be available. So yeah, there would be a new captain. Yeah. You want yeah, I think well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd imagine John Egan would probably be the uh, John Egan would probably be the next in line for captaincy, uh, and maybe maybe part of this from Stephen Kenny because he said at day one was that Seamus Coleman would remain as captain was that actually he knows the character of Seamus Coleman wants him to feel that whether he's playing or not he's still the leader of this squad. The other thing actually uh, talking about James McCarthy and Daryl Shea being called into the squad because he wanted a bit of backup across the back four. Like, is there a possibility, Kenny, that, again, James McCarthy is so important that he changes his system completely because of that, because he doesn't have that one player in the middle, and he does, having planned to go with a four at the back, because McCarthy isn't there, decides to go with three at the back and gets Coleman and Doherty in, and then you go with a midfield two, maybe Malumbi and Hendrick? Yeah, I think, I think that's a fair point. Uh, nice and certainly so and you can, you can even get the front three in to be honest with you I mean back three doesn't mean three five two we'll leave a lot of sides around around Europe now playing with a kind of uh, three four three, three four, formation three, yeah. so that 
So that front three that we're talking about, you can still play that with a, with a back three as well, which are wing backs. So you can slightly think that a back three doesn't traditionally used to mean three, five, and two uh, centre forwards of the pitch. You know, not in the modern game it does. You can still play more of a three, four, three, and, and clubs are having a lot of success uh, playing with that as well. So I think you're right. I think that is an option, but just have a feeling, Stephen might just, I my mean, gut feeling tells me he, he's just got a, in terms of formation, he's, he's kind of not rigid. But he, I think he's got a clear picture in terms of how he wants to yeah. play in that 4-3-3. And I feel as if, even if maybe James McCarthy isn't available, we can't put everything on James' shoulders. If James isn't fit, we've got to change the whole structure, the whole system. Maybe would they be working on these patterns of playing and training day to day in terms of this 4-3-3? You can't suddenly just throw it out the window if one day James McCarthy turns up and he's, he's got an injury. Yeah. So my gut feeling tells me, even if James isn't fit, he'll still stick to this 4-3-3 formation. If that's his preferred uh, system and kind of individual personnel not being available won't affect that too much. That's what the, the League of Ireland watchers who've um, followed his career closely are, are all convinced that that's uh, definitely going to be the case as well. One last question for you, Kenny. Man United being heavily linked with uh, Donny van de Beek, 40 million-ish. Have you seen enough of him to have an opinion on whether or not this is a good idea yet? Yeah, no, yeah, I like him. I'm a big fan of him. Goal-scoring, attacking, attacking midfield player. Really, I'd, I'd see him as a as a number eight, which kind of suits Man United, are pretty much shaped up that way, 4-3-3, three, three, with those two uh, advanced, uh, advanced midfielders. But the problem is, you know, United players in those positions at the moment are really Pogba and uh, Fernandes. I don't see Van Beek operating off the side. He's really a central midfield, attacking midfield player who can score goals. So the only reason, what, when I hear something like that, lads, being leaked, that he's coming for that type of money, then I begin to question maybe Paul Pogba's uh, future at the football club. Maybe if there's a bit of concern that Pogba's not going to be there, he's not going to sign that new contract. Because if he doesn't, then they do have to go and spend again on that type of uh, player, whether it's a Van Beek or a Jack Grealish or, the, or, or that type of player. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of him. I, I, I think he's worth the money. I think he ticks a lot of boxes in terms of his, his qualities, which I've spoken about briefly, but age pro profile as well and things like that so yeah but I think it's an interesting one because for me it just you know uh, pours kind of oil on the forward in terms of Paul Pogba's future if they've been linked to that type of player with the qualities that he has yeah he's actually uh, cheaper and younger than Jack Reilly so what's not to like Kenny good stuff enjoy the week thanks a million nice one lads take care bye Talk bye to you real soon. that's uh, Kenny Cunningham giving us some thoughts on uh, the press conference yesterday from Stephen Kenny and, and effectively picking his 11 for the uh, match as well. The, the back four picks itself, really, does it at this stage, Nathan? No, I think, I, I think Coleman Doherty, uh, nobody's 100% sure what he is going to do. Um, it's probably the biggest decision he faces because dropping Seamus Coleman as his captain is a huge decision and something that would, if results weren't right, turn out to be quite a debate. Uh, again, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, do you play Seamus Coleman away from home and Matt Doherty at home? Can you think like that? So away from home where you're even as much as you want to dominate possession, maybe you don't have quite as much of it, and you play Seamus Coleman, you know you get that solid defensive side. And then at home where you were, Ireland are really going to try and dominate teams, that's where you want Matt Doherty bombing up the right wing. 